Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. Error monitoring is provided by Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. Hi, I'm Vitor Tamayo, and this is Go Time. It's Go Time, a weekly podcast where we discuss interesting topics around the Go programming language, the community, and everything in between. If you currently write Go or aspire to, this is the show for you. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Go Time. Uh, today's episode is number 65. Today on the show, we have myself, Eric St. Martin, Brian Kettleson. Hello. Catalizia. Oh, weird. My, no, like my <laughs> um, <laughs> Skype. <laughs> so Skype just told me that it was reconnecting. Like, what? Yeah. Okay. So we also have Carlicia Pinto here. Hi, everybody. And our special guest for today is... Vitor DeMario, and you're one of the organizers of GopherCon. And uh, something else, like you spoke at, uh, it was a lightning talk, I think, at uh, GopherCon last year. Yes. And you were talking about how you were working on like genetics in Go. And calm down, people. I said genetics, not generics. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about that, but it's going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I did I did that in the Scott Mansfield, Mansfield I think corrected me on Slack, and I oh no, it was uh, somebody else corrected me, and they're like, oh, I never realized it, they were two different words, like they sound different, genetics and generics. Uh, I'm sure I said it I'm the same way. I'm probably gonna have the same problem. I'm Brazilian, just like Carlesia, so and and I don't have a lot of years living in the U.S., so it's probably gonna be a bigger problem for me. Uh, so uh, let's let's talk about the stuff you're working on first, because it's actually a really interesting use case for Go. And I know I get particularly excited about uh, things people work on that are kind of outside the standard, you know, RESTful APIs and things. Yeah. So I started working at a company called Mendelix about four years ago. It's in Sao Paulo. I'm not originally from here, but I came here to work at it. I was told I was going to work in Python at the beginning. I started learning Python, but then... When I came here, there was a small project built by our CEO, who is not a programmer, and he had started it in Go because he liked the language. He thought it was a language he understood relatively well, so he started doing it on his own. He named the project Abracadabra, and it was supposed to be a, a annotator and classifier for mutations. We call them variants usually, but it's the same thing. It's just a mutation. So... What Pandalex does is we receive patients here who are uh, sent, to, sent to us by a physician who thinks they have a genetic disease, and we we take their blood when we process it in our lab, and we we work with all our bioinformatics tools, and then we we generate reports in the end saying whether we found something, if they have a genetic disease or not. And one of these steps was built here with this software, Abracadabra. It, added a lot of information into each one of the variants, which is the part that we call annotation. And we built a machine learning model with random forests in Go. There is a, a very cool library for doing that called Cloud Forest, built by Ryan Bressler. And we used it and we built a model here and, and we started uh, telling our, our physicians which, which variants were relevant in each case and which weren't because everyone has a lot of mutations. So. If we receive an, uh, a patient, and back in the day, we had 50,000 mutations for each one of us, is even if we are healthy, and that's normal. So finding the one that is relevant in the middle of all of it is a big problem. In the beginning, it was a very manual process and had a lot of errors. And then we built the software in Go to try to find these, these mutations better and, and delivering them to our physicians before they had to, to start working on, the, on each case. So you did a sort of like a pre-sorting of sorts to sort out who had uh, mal, mal, how do you say malignant <laughs> mutations? We, we usually Malign say the word pathogenic. Pathogenic. We use pathogenic. Mutations. Yes. Yes. It's it's more it's more like filtering because we 
we don't show the, the ones that are not relevant because there is a lot of data in any case, even if it's a relatively simple case. But what we do is we, we filter it with the result of the machine learning software. All of that written in Go and all of that inside only one program. That is pretty cool. All right, so I, I think we need to back up a little bit. You used about 30 words that meant nothing to me in that whole <laughs> description. Something, something, forest, something. Can, can you kind of back up and tell us about the, the process that gets used and what you're actually yes. computing? Where the data comes from, uh, help me out here because I'm 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 feel stupid. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Before I come across as smarter than Brian, because I didn't ask those questions, I watched his lightning talk, so it sort of made sense to me. <laughs> you, you came prepared. I came prepared. That's all. Yeah. So there are two pieces to this. Two, two about the data. So uh, usually we have very little data. What comes out of our lab and, and comes out of the bioinformatics software is just. A list of mutations. It says, oh, for this per this person, she has a mutation in the chromosome tree in this specific mutation. She should have a uh, an A here and she has a G. That's it. And we have a whole list for for each person saying every mutation that they have. But this doesn't mean much because in this list of mutations, there is the color of your hair, the color of your eyes, all the kind of things that, that make who you who you are, make you special. And in the middle of all of it, there's also things that cause diseases. So what we, we want to do is we want to separate this, these mutations from the ones that don't cause any problem. The way we do it is the first part without any machine learning is just we, we have a lot of databases from bioinformatics tools that most of, the, of those, we, we didn't build them, which is, they are things that can be used by, by anyone working with bioinformatics that tells us more information about each mutation or about each position in the genome. So they say, oh, this position is very conserved. So pretty much all of the species we know that we have sequenced their DNA, they have the same position, and and we never see anything different. So this becomes a number which was created by by a specific research project, and then this number is used by our software later to tell, oh, this is very relevant. So to say if a mutation causes diseases diseases or not. So we have a, we add a lot of information to each one of these variants. So our lists become. Uh, each position in this list of mutations becomes a lot of data. We know uh, which proteins were affected, everything that is that it can be calculated using easy knowledge from biology and from genetics. And this becomes a huge list. There, there are thousands of small points like this for each mutation. So that's the, the point where, where we are before we start talking about machine learning. So after that, we have a huge matrix. You can think about th this list and a lot of a lot of these features become columns. So there's a, a quite big matrix, and we built a machine learning model using an algorithm called random forest. So it's not very popular these days. You, you, you're probably hearing a lot about deep learning and TensorFlow and these kinds of things. But like three or four years ago, we weren't talking that much about, about it. And there are some studies that say that this, this algorithm, random forest, works, works well for, for genomics, for genetic data. And we started working with a library that is built in Go to create these kinds of models. The library is called Cloud Forest. It's pretty much just an implementation of this, of this algorithm. And we started passing our data with all of those extra columns into the software for it to build a, a big model, trying to predict new, new mutations, if they were causing diseases or not, if they were pathogenic or not. So we did a lot of, a lot of rounds, like uh, cleaning up our data, trying to understand how each feature of this software work because I'm not a specialist in machine learning. I don't know much about it. So I had to learn it while I was doing it. And in the end, we, we created several models. We started working with them and one of, one of those were, was, was better. And we put it into the, the real software and we started passing new data into it and trying to predict whether new patients that were coming in, if we could, fi could find their mutations earlier or at least filter out a lot of the things that don't matter before we, we put it into a web page for our doctors to work. Does it make better sense now? Much better sense. So I'm imagining there's not a whole lot of libraries for things like this um, already in Go. No. Was it really time consuming to, to create this sort of stuff? I know this is why like a lot of people keep falling back to like Python and the machine learning and uh, kind of data science spaces, just because there's a lot of good libraries there. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were kind of lucky in that scenario because th- there is there was already before I started working on the software this library that I, that I mentioned, Cloud Forest, and that's all it did. It did random forest models. We created created specifically this algorithm. That's the only thing it did. It, it created a few others, but uh, the most important was this one since it was even in the name, and it was pretty much lucky. There was a this guy, the creator of it, Ryan Bressler. He was a researcher in in genetics, and that's and he liked Go too. A, a few months before I, we started working on it, I, I guess. And so since he liked both of those things, he started building the the tool for himself, for, for just playing around with data, and it grew grew a little bit, and other people started picking it up, not just us. So when we started working on it, and we Kind of knew that that this this algorithm would probably work well for the kind of data that we had, and we started looking for what's available. There was the Brian's library kind of waiting for us, and it worked well. But uh, in machine learning and Go in general, it's a bigger problem because there isn't uh, them that many good libraries. And if you want to use other things that don't necessarily fit your data that well, you don't have as many options as as you do in Python and and other other frameworks and languages. I think it's getting better, though. I've been seeing more and more stuff yes, come out, definitely. especially over the maybe the last year or two. But for a long time, it was kind of a big deterrent from um, the scientific communities was like the lack of um, libraries, especially around some of the like PyNum and things like that. Mm-hmm. It's definitely better now. There are a few people working with it, especially the, the name that comes to my mind immediately is Daniel Whiteneck. He's working on, on Pachyder, and he has a, a book that came out recently which is machine learning with Go. He talks about, I haven't read it yet, unfortunately, but uh, I believe he he shows in the book many algorithms and how they can be implemented in Go. So there are people who are trying to get Go to, to be a good language for it because of the performance and all those things. It can be theoretically a, a, good, a good language to do machine learning in the future. And it's getting better, definitely. Yeah, I know Daniel's been working with a lot of uh, those communities and creating some stuff and a lot of content too. Um, he yes. spoke at Go for Content. Actually, he's he's teaching uh, machine learning with Go workshop uh, this year at Go for Con in uh, Denver. Yeah, it's gonna be great. Uh, yeah, if you're into machine learning and Go, he you definitely want to make friends with Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he he's the guy in this area. <laughs> and we also interviewed him here. Yeah, he was on one of the first episodes. I, yeah, I want to say very... it was within the first twenty twenty five episodes. It was definitely early. There are also now uh, uh, an official client for TensorFlow, so it's not that, that easy to to build a model for, in Go if you're trying to use TensorFlow, but you can build a model in Python and and upload it to, to Google Cloud ML or maybe host it yourself and use your software to to use it, to send new data into it, and that's what we are doing now. We, we ended up moving away from Random Forest recently, uh, in the last year, and now we are using TensorFlow, and the software that the, the talks to the TensorFlow model is still in Go. Okay, so you basically have, you know, say your data scientists and things like that um, create yes. the model in the tools that they're used to, but then you kind of consume the model in Go. Exactly. So in the in the beginning, the random forest story that I told, it was pretty much just me with a, a few other people here, but mo- most of it was built by me. And later I told them, okay, I'm not a specialist. We, we need people that actually know what they're doing. They can't really do a trial and error for, forever. So now we have a person, Fernanda, who, who is uh, a data scientist, and she knows a lot more about machine learning than we do. And she built it in, uh, a new model using TensorFlow. Well, most of her work was in Python. But then we integrated into into the Go software, and it, it kind of consults her model through our Go software. That's really awesome. So, and the performance of it, I imagine, is one of the key reasons why you're using it in this space, right? Yes, yes. As as with pretty much everything in Go, the performance is really good. Now we, it's one of our bottlenecks because there is a lot of things that is that is happening when we, we were trying to classify a variant. We had it being one of the bottlenecks in the random forest world too, and same thing with TensorFlow now because there is a lot of data going around and you have to to do a lot of computation in each each mutation to try to find the result but we are also experimenting a little bit with hosting the the tensorflow model inside the program inside a container with our binaries and it's working really well and we, we are probably going to have really good results we already have pretty good results but they are going to be really really fast in the near future i hope 
Now, I'm imagining this is CPU bound, right? Yes, it is. Now, was this um, written in something prior or was it kind of just kind of a whole new project and you kind of picked it? It was a whole new project, yeah. Uh, in the talk that Khadija, the lighting talk that Khadija saw in Denver, uh, I I usually show a slide where uh, where there is a, the first version of the software is, isn't entirely in that slide. There's like 800 lines or 1,000 lines all in one file. Our uh, our CTO CEO who's not a programmer thought that was fine. That was one of the first things that we changed. Okay, this this is not a a, a decent program. We gotta do some do some work on top of it. But it was completely new. He showed it to us. It was pretty much just an idea before, and then. There wasn't any prior software before it. All your IP in a single <laughs> slide. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> now, of course, there were there were other things that we were doing, but uh, this whole annotation and classification thing, uh, it was all there in the first version. That's awesome. Now it's very striking too that a doctor. I wonder if he probably probably knew how to program before. I would imagine, but he just yes, a picked bit. up. Uh, brand new cutting edge language that maybe didn't have that much documentation back then in, in examples and just said, hey, this looks great and simple enough. Yeah, what the hell? I'll just write some code. Yeah. Yeah. And put it in production. He has said many times to us, uh, s since that day that uh, if he could come back in time, he wouldn't be a doctor, he would be an engineer. So since he, he didn't do that, now he tries to do uh, as much engineering as possible when he has time for it. So he's not only a doctor, he's also running a company. So there, there isn't much time for him to do that, but he, he's trying to do all, all of it at once. Like the commercial, I'm not an engineer, but I play one on TV. <laughs> yeah. I'm not an engineer, but I play one on TV. <laughs> yeah, nobody knows why he looked into going for, oh, this is better than Python, oh, this is... Uh, friendlier to me, but well, it worked and was kind of a happy accident. Yeah, it could just be the amount of hype. You know, you go into a lot of programming forums and things, and a lot of people, you know, are experimenting with Go and Rust because the past couple of years, that's really mm -hmm. um, two of the main languages that have, I guess, Scala a bit too. I'm trying to think of some other ones that have kind of got super hyped in the last couple of years, but I think he enjoyed the simplicity as well because there, there wasn't much to learn in terms of the syntax of the language and that kind of thing. You could pick it up and start working pretty soon, pretty, pretty fast. So that he didn't have to, to learn what a list comprehension is or something like that if you're going to compare it to other languages. That's true, too. Yeah, I mean, you look at some languages and they're, they're extremely confusing. And then you have languages that seem simple if you have a programming background beforehand. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, I guess it's hard to look at... Um, any language and think about what it might look like to somebody who's never programmed before. Mm -hmm. Like I, I remember Ruby, right? Like Ruby, like, Oh, super, super, super readable. Right. Well, not if you show a non programmer, right? <laughs> That's true. Yes. If you have a background, you'll probably see things familiar there. I, I also think the, the, the explicitness, the fact that everything is, is quite clear in the code helps you. So uh, some of the, of the, I don't know, more complicated, Topics like understanding why he should use an interface in, in a place or why a bigger interface, a big interface is a problem. That kind of thing is not that clear. But uh, if we're talking about handling errors and seeing why, why something failed in the program, it's all very, very almost obvious. So he can read the code and he can understand what is going on. So I think that, that helps a lot too, not only in terms of the syntax of the language. Yeah, this is one thing that really strikes me about Go. You can write a very complex system without using any interface or Go routines or anything that could be complicated depending on your experience in programming. Now, of course, the more code you write without using these things, the more you have to keep in your head and you, can put, you could potentially simplify it by using interfaces, by using uh, and make it more efficient by using routine, Go routines, but you don't have to. You can have a perfectly functional program. Yeah, you can still survive without those things. Yeah. So the first version of the program that he showed us had none of this of those things, and and for a while there wasn't anything. We were trying to separate things into into packages, and we had a, our own problems trying to rebuild things in the way we were used to in other languages. So uh, we came from Java or from C sharp, depending on who was working on each part of the code. So 
uh, we, we tried to do the things that, were, that we thought were natural and they didn't necessarily fit goal. So there was all of that. But, so he had his, his own issues not, not knowing the, those things and we also had them. So after, after a while, we, we all kind of converged, understanding the language better. So you are one of the organizers of GopherCon Brazil? Yes, I am. There. We are a team of five. And I heard it was a very successful event this last year. That was uh, November? Yes, in November. And I think this was the year first, two? The first one was November two. Yes. The first one was in 2016 in November as well. And, and the second one was November last year. Kalija was there this time. I heard. I was there. <laughs> I, I still want to make it. I uh, I was I was trying to get a passport and visa turned around in time, and it just wasn't happening. Yeah, that, that's a big problem for people in the U.S. I'm here to give a testimony. It was a it was a fantastic event. You know, the organizers. I consider them all my friends, and I don't want to be like a, like a like a fan girl, but they did everything they said they were going to do. There was no disappointment. All of these speakers who were supposed to be there were there as for the, the latest uh, rost roster. And um, it was just great. The talks were great. We hung out afterwards. And I don't know. I had a great time, learned a ton, met new people. There were, what, 200 people there? 200 attendees? Uh, you were saying about 250, more or less. Yeah, I thought that was more than 200. Yeah, that's really awesome. So, something around that. Yeah, we had about 180 in the first edition, something like that. We don't have the exact numbers, but based on the ticket sales is, is what we, we were close to. And so, so you can see that that's not that big of a of a of, of growth from, from one year to the other. But one thing that changed a lot is that since things worked out for the first year, we didn't know how it was going to go. We invested a lot more in the infrastructure and... Uh, we had a much better setup this year for audio, for video, for, for everything. So it, it kind of gave us the sensation that things were for real. Now we were doing a, a professional conference. And I don't know if, yeah. if Kalisa had the same sensation, but for me, who was there for the first year and then for the second, there was a really huge difference. I wasn't there for this first year, but I felt that, like I said, everything that were supposed to happen happened. There were no glitch. I didn't see any glitch. I was very pleased. It was a very professional, very well put together. Everything worked on a schedule. And I was very happy to see that Google, to see Google sponsoring the conference this year, and hopefully they will continue to do it. It was such a, uh, sponsorships are so important. It's what allows conferences to get better and better, right? And uh, as they learn what they need, um, they will be able to address things and make it better. You know, what's funny is that was probably one of the first things Brian and I wanted to fix after our first year too. We're like, we got to do better AV. Yeah. We had no idea what we were doing and the second year got a lot better. Yeah. I understand the feeling really, really well. When are the videos going to be out? I don't know. We had some problems with it and, and it was supposed to be out already, but I, I can't give you a date yet. I hope soon, but I'm not really directly involved in that now. So. I can give okay. you a date. So for people thinking about going to the GoForCon Brazil conference, and if you're from outside Brazil and you need a visa, just heads up that you need to start working on the visa way before the yeah, trip. Months. Yes, it takes a while. It takes a while. So um, speaking of kind of people coming in from other countries, um, like what were kind of the like geographic um, demographics there? Was it mostly a lot of people from Brazil and South America, or was it um, a lot of people yeah. flying in from other countries? Most of the most of the attendees were, were from Brazil, and in the first year, especially, the, there were uh, a lot of people coming from other places in South America, like Argentina and Peru, even given talks. And this year, I, I don't think that that many came. There was a group from Colombia. I know the. I think there was another group, but I don't remember exactly which country it was from. Other than that, we get mostly people from the U.S. that that come to to speak at the event. So some of our talks are in English, and it's okay. It's a we consider it part of the conference being bilingual. And 
Aditya, which was one of the speakers this year, he, he wanted to submit a talk to us exactly because of that reason. He, he wanted to show how the Go language itself could be rewritten in other languages, how he could change the, the keywords into Bengali or Portuguese. And, and he said, no, this is the best place to do it because the conference is bilingual. So we have a few people from the US because of that, they, because of the talk submissions, and a few people from, from the rest of South America too because of the proximity. But Brazil itself is huge. So some people come from bigger distances than the people from Argentina or Chile, just from inside Brazil. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah Brazil is considered a continental country, so it, it's bigger than a few continents. So it's, really, it's huge. Now I can't wait for the videos to come out because I didn't even see um, Aditya's talk um, about translating. Like, that's pretty cool. He actually did a lightning talk with the same, same topic in Denver. But then he expanded it for go for Brazil. Ah, uh, yeah. See, we get so caught up on the final day. Like, I, I didn't catch any of the lightning talks. And that's one thing I haven't got a chance to do is watch any of the videos for those. He did a similar talk at Golang UK, and it was really, really good. Just actually beyond good. It blew my mind. It was, it was awesome. Yeah, I haven't seen anything similar to what he did. It was really impressive. So have you, um, are, are you confident you're having a 2018 version? Yes, we already have everything set up with the, the venue. We're going to repeat the venue for the third time. And the date's already out, too. It's going to be in the end of September, from the 27 to the 29, I believe. We don't have yet speakers, or and we haven't confirmed any of the sponsors yet, but the conference is definitely going to happen. So it sounds like your CFP will be out soon, too. We're probably going to start it in, in the beginning of April, I think. Okay, so a little later. It's it's actually kind of like if you want to speak at a Go conference, like now is the time. I think there's what were we talking about the other night, Brian? There's like three or four Go conferences. With yeah, CFPs. there's several CFPs open right now, which means it's a good time to polish off your editors and start writing proposals. We want yours. We want everyone's proposal. Yeah, I, I want I want to be one one of the people sending sending proposals to to you as well and to go for con in Iceland and other places too but I haven't yet excellent so I heard that the kubecon CFP for I think it was Copenhagen has something like 3,000 submissions I, I don't want to see that many uh, I can't imagine having to select talks with that many I, it's yeah. pretty much impossible uh we, we had over 300 last year or something like that that was painful like I don't want to say painful because like I, I, I like reading the CP, CFPs and things like that. And it's, I find all the content really interesting, but like trying to squeeze in time to review 300 proposals is a challenge, especially being 200 of them wait till the last 48 hours. <laughs> and some of them are really good, but you have to say no anyway, because yeah. there aren't enough slots. And I, I think this is one of the, the hardest parts of it. Yeah. Oh, without a doubt. You know, when you're, yeah, when you're looking at the ones that, you know, didn't make it and it's, it's not a reflection of the, them or the quality of their talk. It's just, you know, you've got 15 or 20 speaking slots and 300 proposals. Yeah. We had between 50 and 60 and there were a few talks that I wanted to, to, to see in the conference and there weren't enough slots. I can't, I can't imagine with 300, like you or like 1300 or 3000, I don't know the 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 exact number for KubeCon. It's there are definitely going to be a lot of a lot of good material that I can't can't fit in the conference. I think we should just like rent a city for like a month, <laughs> and it's just Oprah Winfrey. You get a talk, and you get a talk. Just everybody <laughs> gets to talk. Yeah, and pay people salary too, right? For a month, like take take a sabbatical. We'll oh, pay right, your salary yeah. and just come <laughs> to watch because. We need people to watch the talks too. Yeah, that's always difficult too, um, especially like, and this is why like Carlisi was saying, talking about sponsorships, like, you know, with sponsorship money, you're able to pay travel and accommodations and all that stuff for speakers, which is important because not everybody works for a company that will, will fund them to go um, speak at a conference or even specific ones, depending on the technologies they work with versus where they want to go to talk. But, uh, you know, sponsorships and uh, volunteers, the, those things really make or, make or break a conference. 
I remember last year talking about CFPs. I was one of the people who helped review the CFPs. And I remember sitting, it was two weeks, two weekends of coffee and nothing else but reviewing those CFPs at the very end. And I reviewed every single one of them. And Dave Cheney was the one, I think he's always the one to lead the effort of reviewing the CFPs. And at the end, he said, almost like all reviewers reviewed all the CFPs. It's a lot of work and it makes a huge difference, but you know, the more eyes there are on the process, the better the, the selection process is. Yeah, I was actually quite amazed that um, every talk was reviewed by every person. And you, you get different opinions and sometimes you, you say something and you think the, the talk is good or you think it isn't. And another person comes in and says, no, but you, you didn't think about that. That changes the... Changes my point of view completely. So that happened a lot in our CFP, which was much smaller. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely happened a lot at yours too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we actually try to rotate out our um, review committee too every year, just to kind of make sure that it's not like a echo chamber where it's the same, you know, mm -hmm. five or 10 people selecting talks every year. That way, you know, this year, maybe there weren't as many talks that, you know, target kind of your your experience. but next year there might be because the committee's all different yeah it makes things fresh well this year we have a new program chair at GopherCon. it's going to be ashley mcnamara cool dave has handed over the scepter yeah given the reception to her talk last year i think she's a great great choice she's gonna do a great job for sure we all love ashley actually uh, i'm gonna be a little bit mean here because I met her in Denver for the first time, and she didn't know who I was, of course, because uh, nobody knew back then. But uh, she actually told me she would do a, a version of, of the logo of the software I was talking about, Abracadabra. He's a bunny these days, and he should become a girlfriend. And we never spoke about it again, and it never happened. So I, I still like to do it. Oh. So wait, a logo for your company? No, for the software, Abracadabra, yeah. Which is a commercial software. A, yeah, yeah. The thing is that, as far as I understand, she doesn't take money, and to do this, uh, you know, mm. logo for commercial products, she should be paid. But then, yeah, I, I'm problem. sure she selected like, well, if I'm not gonna get paid, I will just, I don't know what she focuses on, but maybe commercial, something related to a commercial product. It's probably low on the priority list. It was never official. I only used it in the in the slides I do internally here and the ones I did in Denver and the and the first edition of GoProCon Brazil. But now we are thinking about not thinking. We are already working on splitting the software into several parts and and some of it's going to be open source. So perhaps it can be a new logo for the for the open source version. We are going to need one. Well, I know they take a lot of time. So oh yeah, uh, definitely. It's it's not an easy thing to do. Oh yeah, I know. Of of course she she does a lot more than that and, and and logos for several several cool cool open source software so it, it's not guaranteed but I, I'm kind of jealous of everyone that already got one. <laughs> everyone <laughs> else has a logo. Yeah, I yeah. can understand that. <laughs> but it's not fair. She she has a lot on her plate. Well, she has a day job for sure. Yeah. Yeah, my, my coworker is saying here on the on the chat that we should open source the the software as soon as possible to get a cool logo. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are several other people in the community that are making logos too. Um, yes, that's true. we sh we should get you connected with with some of them so that you can get some some good Gopher logos if Ashley's too busy. Yeah, that would be great. I know she's been trying to focus a lot of her time lately on on doing her main job, which is writing software. So we'll have to get you connected and see if she's got time. I'm sending in the chat the current version of, of what the bunny looks like. That's that's actually pretty funny. I, like, I can see this as like a pitch deck to the business on why you should open source your proprietary uh, project. <laughs> <laughs> it's like number one to get a cool logo. <laughs> yeah. They're like, but how do we make money? Do you not see? I said cool logo. Yeah, we got a logo from Ashley McNamara. Hello. Priority. Yeah, that, that's an instant Series A right there. Yeah, I mean, step one, have cool Ashley McNamara logo. Step two, question mark. <laughs> step three, profit. <laughs> profit. Exactly. Sounds great to me. 
So uh, looking at the time, does everybody want to roll into interesting Go projects and news? Yes. Let's do it. Let's do it. So I want to go first because I think this is ridiculously cool. Why do you get to go first? Because <laughs> I never go first. So Fine. I'm stealing first. So um, I came across, I think it was last week sometime. Um, I, I think the GitHub username is Hunter Loft is. Um, and the name of the project is called PBR. And it's a PB, 3D like, render. What's that? Wait PBR like Pep's Blue Ribbon? PBR? Correct. Okay. Is that in the sure. document? Because I don't see it. Uh, it is. It's further down. I'm going to drop it in the channel. Um, but it's a 3D render written in Go. And I just think that's ridiculously awesome. Like oh, there's, wow. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm just really addicted to, you know, like non-standard things written in Go. And I thought a 3D renderer in Go was pretty badass. Wow. You look at the examples on their... Uh... GitHub repo, that's mind blowing. They are really impressive. Impressive. This, this Millennium Falcon is so detailed. Even. Wow. No. Yep. All right. I forgive you for going first, Eric. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who's next? So I have exciting news. The uh, folks at Wallaroo Labs released the Wallaroo API for Go. And uh, Wallaroo, if you haven't seen it, is some pretty amazing um, statistical software, uh, streaming software. I don't even know how to describe it. It's, it's really cool stuff. And it's uh, written in Pony, which is one of my uh, favorite little side languages to play with. And uh, they have an API now that's written in Go. So if you want to learn about um, streaming and messaging and, and play with it in Go, um, the Wallaroo Go API is now available and it's pretty slick. I played with it this morning. I actually didn't see that. I'm looking at it now. There's too many cool things to play with. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's ridiculous. I could quit my job and just play with things full time and still run <laughs> out of time to play with cool things. Yeah, there needs to be like some sort of like filter for uh, whether or not we should play with stuff. Isn't that we should us? split it. Isn't that our job? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. We're the filter. Damn it. All right, We're so go filter. play with this. I'm, I'm telling you, go play with, with Wallaroo because it's really awesome. And Pony, too. If, if you like playing with languages, Pony is, is awesome. And it's named Pony because uh, when the designer of the language told people everything he wanted to put in the language, somebody replied with, well, why don't you just ask for a Pony, too? Because it, it has all of the features. That's awesome. That's hilarious. I, I, think, I think we've mentioned it before, but another cool language to play with is Nim. Yeah, I like Nim too. We'll have to like do a, a language of the week or month or something and just recommend some new language for people to play with. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's add that as a, as a to-do note. Talk about interesting languages every once in a while. All right, so another project that came out uh, yesterday hit the, hit the wires hard is twerp from twitch which is a competitor for grpc and twerp is a big deal because it does not require http2 and that's important if you're behind a load balancer that doesn't support http2 so twerp looks fast and it looks pretty lightweight and it looked to me particularly like the uh, the, the cognitive overhead of using twerp might be just a little bit lighter than using gRPC. So I'm interested to try twerp out, but I haven't yet. It also allows JSON payloads and the messages. So you can handcraft messages in it and you can't with gRPC. Hmm. Oh, that's correct. That's a good flexibility. Yeah. Very nice. I always wonder how people come up with these names like twerp. I mean, it looks like almost like Twitch and RPC, except it's missing the C. Yep. Naming is hard. Maybe it's just because it's other people's names. I like them better, but I feel like I couldn't come up with a name that's cool like that. Mine are very descriptive. <laughs> like, go database client, you know? <laughs> <laughs> let's, not, let's not talk about naming. I have currently a folder called common with a file 
named shared.go. Nice. I know. Help me. That's okay. an anti-pattern, by the way. That, that's oh. that's an anti. Just yeah. just FYI. It, it, no is kidding. Is the package name utils? Yeah. The package <laughs> the package is called common, with a one file name called shared.go. Yep. We're 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 taking away your badge. I need help, people. <laughs> I seriously. We're sending Ben Johnson over for an immediate go oh package <laughs> intervention. <laughs> Hmm. Any other interesting news? I'll go then. Uh, my friend Scott Kurowski sent me, so he works with Mongo, and he sent me news that they are doing an official MongoDB Go driver. And this is interesting because there is a heavily used Go driver already, but they are going, they decided to. Um, do an official what they're going to call the official one and put it on their own repo i suppose and there is a big blog post explaining why they des- they decided to do that so i'm just saying this because for people who who do use mongodb which is a lot of people this might be relevant for them so and they people who might want to participate in this development or not i'm confused because i saw this headline and i didn't realize that this was talking about mgo so Gustavo Niemeyer was the head of the MGO project forever. 2011, I think, is when that came out. And everybody in the community uses MGO. And for the longest time, the people at Mongo recommended MGO as one of the best written drivers that took advantage of all of the possible features of Mongo. And this this blog post they wrote makes it sound like it's limiting and not Really a great driver. So this is quite a, a flip in opinion for a company. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like I actually remember um, borrowing some of the uh, Bison logic out of that driver just because it was it was done so. Yeah, well. the driver is beautiful, and I don't know what the word count on this is, but it looks like two thousand words talking about why this open source driver written by the community and contributed freely from people's spare time doesn't meet their needs. That's kind of a kick in the teeth for open source, isn't it? I think what it's, it might be saying that, but it's also saying that uh, they need some, some, they, they need more control as far as to what gets in. They need to have more say, apparently what they want to, there are things that they wanted to get in that weren't getting in. It's for community consensus, so they decided, well, I, don't, I guess we form our own community <laughs> with the ideals that will fit our goals better. I, I don't know. I'm not uh, taking sides, just trying to... So if I'm understanding this correctly, they're still going to do an open source driver, but now they're, they are basically going to be the core maintainers of it instead right. of trying to be a contributor to somebody else's. Right. And they're not, they're not forking. They're just starting new. Yeah. Another announcement by Gustavo himself that he wasn't going to work on the MGO driver anymore. And, and he was looking for someone else to kind of take over him some time ago. I don't think he's, he's doing that anymore, but the, with this post from the MongoDB guys, I, I kind of feel like the, they missed an opportunity in communication. So if they had talked to Gustavo, maybe, they could take over the project themselves and we would have the best of both, both worlds, perhaps. It's it's also possible that this is a reaction or that Gustavo's could wanting to, to not maintain anymore is a reaction to this. I don't know. Uh, no use attributing drama or malice where uh, we don't know that yes. there's any, but, but yeah. this certainly smells like it might have some. We don't know that any conversation did or did not take place. So. Yes, that's true. Yeah, it's actually interesting, too, because, you know, um, like I haven't read the post, so I, I don't know whether it speaks to this, but it's also quite possible that, you know, um, since MGO or MGO or however you pronounce the, the library name came out, um, like MongoDB as a database and platform and company has changed a lot um, and evolved and they may have learned new practices and things like that in um, it would be a tremendous amount of work to put those into the existing library, and they felt it's easier to design from scratch. 
it doesn't look like it seems more like a vision and planning and stuff like that that they were is mentioned here just kind of scanning through it. it there's not a lot that i see about like a technical nature so it could be driven by some sort of technical thing that refactoring it to fit their new design yeah well i hope they treated uh gustavo well because he was a huge champion for uh, the go community and for mongo yeah and i actually i owe him a contact to bring him on the show i can't believe i haven't done that yet right we want to have him on the show (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, you can get him on the show when Victor gets his uh, Ashley Gopher, and we'll we'll just do all of it at once. I still remember the very very first Gopher Con, and Gustavo was the speaker, and like was helping us uh, pack bags, like stuff swag bags. Yeah, like I love I love seeing um, the community and the conferences and stuff like that all evolve, but. Like I have very fond memories of like the early days, you know, where you could you could almost if you were given enough time, you could almost list everybody in the community, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the the real central figures were the ones that were downstairs at the Marriott in Denver, helping us uh, fill out swag bags and showing up early for the conference and working the like Corey Lanou working the working the desk, the registration desk, while everybody else was watching. Uh, conference talks didn't have to do that but that was his contribution to the community those were those were nice days and and that that sense of community has never left go which i love I'm, i've got little goosebumps right now because our, our community is so awesome now Victor, do you get a lot of volunteers for go for con brazil we did a lot more this year than the than the last one uh, actually 2017 than 2016 because i think uh, a lot of people heard about it so actually one of the of the volunteers helped us a lot and i i kind of want to name her which was ellen corbis and i hope i'm saying her name right she did a lot for us and she was there for before the conference started she was already helping us and she did a lot as the conference were Continued, and even in the last day, she did one of the workshops with Daniela Petrozalek, and uh, they both kind of teamed up in the, in the end and did one of the, the best workshops in the conference. So Ellen did a lot for us. And a lot of other people also talked about maybe helping with volunteers, but she, she was the, the main one. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I applaud great. everybody who volunteers and, and helps out, especially for, for some of the conferences and stuff like that where they're not um, commercial events and stuff like that you know there's it's a lot of people making sacrifices of their personal time and stuff like that so for anybody who's willing to do that like i applaud them yes and daniela wasn't as actually a volunteer but she she kind of ended up being in a in a similar way to ellen because she's she spoke she did the workshop she came up with the idea of doing a diversity scholarship for us for the first time as well and she helped kalija as well with her talk and she, mm-hmm. she was pretty much everywhere I don't know how, how she survived the conference doing everything that she did, but we, we wouldn't be the same without everything that Daniela did. Well, speaking of that, if you go to her Twitter, which is D-A-N-I-C-A-T-83, she's running a fundraiser to go talk at a conference in San Francisco. And I donated to that this morning because I would love to see her talk. So if you are able to go donate to that, uh, it's definitely a worthy cause. She's an amazing helper in our community. So, um, you know, go help if you can. Absolutely. All right. How about free software Friday? We ready? Sounds good to me. All right. I got to start this one. Cause Eric, you know, I can't even believe you kicked me out of the last one. What the hell? So free <laughs> software, this is big too. This is really, how long have we waited for a new version of bootstrap? A couple of years, bootstrap four dropped today and it's looking good. And I'm sorry, but I know I'm going to lose my hipster credentials. I think pretty much anything made with Bootstrap looks good. You know, they did a great job with it. And I, I think Bootstrap websites are pleasing. Showing my age probably, but damn it, I like Bootstrap. I, so, you know, I, it's interesting, like, because I, I cut my teeth in web development. So I've gone from the table-based design to div-based and CSS and all that stuff. Then the grid frameworks and I don't grid frameworks and css were like java framework or javascript frameworks now like so many new ones were getting kicked off all the time and like bootstrap has kind of came around and like that's 
one of my favorites. There's there's two now that I kind of look at. Um, I'll admit I'm not as connected to that world, so there may be more now. And I may be wrong about the fact that CSS frameworks aren't popping up every day again. They are. But Bootstrap's <laughs> still the reigning <laughs> champion. It's just for the fact that they were they were out there early on when there was nothing. That was like, yeah. oh wow, <laughs> life changing. Yeah. So big love to all of the people contributing to Bootstrap and to Twitter for uh, having the foresight to release that as a as a framework. Thank you. Who's next? I can go next. So today I felt virtuous for like a second and a half. When I opened up my Twitter <laughs> <laughs> and I saw Frances tweet saying that he didn't know about something that I knew about. <laughs> I'm like, check that, that out. That's good, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Check me. Not only I knew about it, like I've used it. And he's like, how did I not know about this? <laughs> so it just goes to show, you know, it bears repeating. Some of the projects bears repeating. It's not everybody knows about, so even like really good stuff that's out there. So my shout out to go to Kelsey's high, Kelsey, how, <laughs> Kelsey Hightower's configuration library called mconfig which is really neat. It just lets you uh, hide your environment variables in the, in the file and um, use it in your application. It's pretty neat. Yeah, I've used it for many years and I love it. It's really flexible, it's really easy to use and solves all our problems. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. It's, it's probably been a couple of years. I actually forgot about it too. I, I know I used it a couple of years ago, but uh, it's definitely yeah, we, been a while. We used it together back at um, that other job. <laughs> whatever that was yeah it's actually surprising how many times brian and i end up uh <laughs> working together um I, I feel like we just can't get away from each other uh, we, we're like magnets i'm gonna go off and work for this company and then shh. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm like that thing that's stuck on your shoe from the parking lot so yeah and and brian got a promotion uh uh, what was it last week? The week before? Last week. Uh, last week, yeah. Yeah. So Brian uh, now runs his own team, and now Brian will be my boss again. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray! Yeah, when Brian and I first met, he was my boss. Congratulations, Brian. Thank you. It's very exciting. We're running a a team doing all open source work at Microsoft. And wow, who who would have thought those days were here? I love it so much. Yeah. That was said a few years ago. Nobody would believe. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it really is amazing to kind of see um, the evolution and for us to, you know, you know, the, the developer advocates, you know, everybody kind of contributes to open source and stuff. But I think that Microsoft has been seeing that, you know, uh, and, and loving that. So they wanted to kind of spin something up where uh, at least a a subset of us get to spend more of our time doing that than you know some of the other things that we do as developer advocates. And I'm ridiculously excited to be working for Brian again and on open source. <laughs> you make a good team. It's going to be kind of awesome. And pretty much everyone in the Go Go world know, knows about that. <laughs> I still <laughs> like speaking of team. I still remember the very first GopherCon because at this time, like everybody only knew each other by like handles and names on, on mailing lists. And everybody was asking Brian and I um, how they would be able to recognize us. And Brian, I forget who he told, he's like, oh, we're, we're, we're the ones that look like Penn and Teller. And I'm like, what? Because <laughs> he's so much taller than me. I, I feel a little bit bad about that now. Does Oops. that mean I'm not allowed to talk? <laughs> yes, it does. I'm sorry. <laughs> no more talking for you. Where were we? I think we were doing Free Software Friday, weren't we? <laughs> we, we were somewhere <laughs> around there. So, uh, Victor, did you have uh, somebody you wanted to give a shout out to? Yeah, yeah. I have a library called, not, not I have, I have a library to talk here on the show called Go Releaser. It's done by uh, another guy in Brazil. His name is Carlos Becker, and it's got uh, like, more than 2,000 stars on GitHub, and it does 
Uh, it creates Go binaries for pretty much every pro platform you can imagine. Helps you create great GitHub releases, push push your software as a homebrew formula, and all the kinds of things. So I've heard of other other projects right, using his software to to make the the release of new versions easier, and it's been pretty su successful. Yeah, Go releaser is awesome. So I have a confession to make. At my uh, GoLang UK talk, I announced was it GoLang UK? Uh, some talk late last year, I announced uh, Go for Rocks, which was the same thing. It was the ability to tag and release stuff to GitHub. And then like three weeks after I did that talk, I found Go Releaser and it's done and it's beautiful and it had a million better features than Go for Rocks. And I just abandoned it because Go Releaser does it all already. So yeah, thank you for that. I feel like that's almost every open source project I create. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is awesome. Oh, wait, somebody did it better than me. And moving on. And I'm actually happy about that. Yeah, it doesn't hurt my feelings. It's it's kind of awesome that uh, it, it exists and it's far better. Yeah, I wanted to highlight it too because of the, the fact that a Brazilian did it. So I, I kind of had to talk about it. And uh, mconfig, which Kalizi talked about, uh, so I saw someone saying the, in, in the same thread that she mentioned with, with Frances that there is also a kind of a competitor made by, by a guy from, from Sao Paulo here, which uh, participates a lot in, in our meetups, which is... Uh, I, re I don't remember the name of the library, something config, but it's from Cesar Jimenez, CR Jimenez on, on GitHub. So uh, I'm kind of happy to see these projects coming out of Brazil. Sometimes we we are kind of we are kind of silent here. Nobody knows what's going on, but there are a few cool projects coming out of the country as well. Awesome. So people have to go to Brazil and meet all these amazing developers. Yes, and go for Com Brazil is the best opportunity for that. Everyone's going to be in the same place. Isn't uh... Suru it come out of Brazil too? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And the and, uh, and I heard about Go Release it because of Suru. I saw one of the Suru guys who, who is also one of the organizers of GoForCon Brazil, Guilherme. He was talking about it with the Go Release uh, uh, created on on Twitter. So Suru is uh, one of the, our, mo our most successful projects for sure. Guilherme or, or Andrews? No, I saw Guilherme talking with uh, with uh, with Carlos. So there are two Suru guys that who are organizers of the Brazilian. Yes, well, one for, one former Andrews and one current Guilherme. Yeah, they they kind of sw switched places when when Andrews left the team, they hired Guilherme. So they are both on the GoForCon team, GoForCon Brazil team. I think that uh, that was going to happen anyway. Suru is uh, is the biggest, probably the biggest Go project in Brazil, and uh, one of the teams that talks uh, that talks more in conferences everywhere. So. One of them was going to be in the in the GoForCon Brazil team. That that was pretty much guaranteed. Mm -hmm. How about you, Eric? Did you have a, a free software Friday today? I did. So um, was it last week or the week before? We were kind of talking about serverless a little bit. Um, and there's this uh, really cool project by Alex Ellis called OpenFAS, which is Open Functions as a Service. And um, it can basically have your functions backed by Docker containers and kind of a, a way to do serverless that way. And um, I think they call it like open fast Netties, which allows you to have it backed by Kubernetes. Now, open fast by itself doesn't require Kubernetes, but there is a, a, I think they've got the Kubernetes bit merged in so that you can use Kubernetes as part of open fast if you want to so you can deploy it on kubernetes or off it's really slick stuff so and yeah i'm actually really interested to see how um this project itself um advances too and especially like with the building over kubernetes and stuff like i really am digging watching people build abstractions over the top of kubernetes and docker and like i feel like we're just getting more and more innovative well you've been preaching that for for years now that Kubernetes is just the foundation that we should be building our software on, not a, de a deployment platform. It's, it's an architectural foundation. And I've been listening to you because you're smart and it makes sense to do that. Uh, yeah, but I mean, it's going to, I think it really is going to be interesting over the next couple of years to see what um, people build to abstract even Kubernetes away. And I feel like I don't, I, I have a vision enough to see that that's the thing that's going to happen, but I don't have a vision enough to be the creator of that thing. Okay, so did we make it through everybody? 
I think we did. All right. Anybody have any other projects or people you want to give shout outs to before we close the show up? All right. I will take that as a no. Uh, so thanks everybody for being on the show. Uh, especially thank you to Viter for coming on and talking to us about genetics and not generics. <laughs> thanks, Victor, for not talking about generics. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't go there. Thanks for having me on the show, and and I'd like to thank Alicia especially for for talking with me about it and opening this opportunity. Of course, it was so great to have you here. It's a great show. Thank you. So thanks everybody for listening. Um, you can find us at gotime.fm online or on Twitter at gotime.fm. If you want to be on the show, have suggestions for guests or topics, uh, create an issue at on github.com slash gotime.fm slash ping. And with that, goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. All right, that's it for this episode of Go Time. Tune in live on Thursdays at 3 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community in Slack with us. In real time during the shows, head to changelog.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at GoTimeFM. Special thanks to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. Also, Linode, we host everything we do on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash changelog. GoTime is edited by Jonathan Youngblood, and the theme music for GoTime is produced by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. We'll see you again next week. Thanks for listening.